Great. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. Um, we're now watching in Europe the largest and bloodiest war that Europe's seen since World War II ended in 1945. Uh, it was a simmering conflict for uh, seven, eight years, uh, and then Russia in February of last year launched a full-scale assault on Ukraine. Um, and it's clearly not going the way the Kremlin wanted, but how it plays out will affect American interests. So what I wanna talk about today are a little bit of background of the war, what, what led to it, the course of the war to date, what might happen over the course of the next year. And I'll talk a bit about American policy and then also some broader implications that go beyond Russia, Ukraine to, well, Ukraine itself, Russia and Europe. But first, let me ask, um, why should we care? I mean, I, I spent three years in Ukraine. I have a reason to care, but Ukraine's 5,000 miles away. The United States has a lot on its foreign policy plate. First and foremost, how do we deal with the rise of China? So, so why do we care with, about this country? And let me give you two or three reasons. One, um, going back more than 70 years, the United States has defined a stable and secure Europe as a vital national interest. And there are political reasons for that. Uh, Europe shares a lot of American interest and values. There are economic reasons. Uh, Europe is a huge trade and investment partner. Uh, and there are security reasons. And how this war comes out is going to impact whether there's a stable and secure Europe. If Russia prevails, it will be unstable, it will be insecure. And it's going to command more American attention at the top level and more resources that might otherwise be devoted to China. A second reason to care is uh, I think we have to be humble about Vladimir Putin's intentions and our understanding. When Putin talks about Ukraine, he sometimes refers to historic Russian lands, that Ukraine was once part of the Russian Empire. Uh, but if you look at a map of Europe in, say, the end of the 19th century, what you're going to see is not only most of modern day Ukraine, uh, but uh, Finland, the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and most of Poland were once part of the Russian Empire. And so there's this question, if Putin wins in Ukraine, does his intention go beyond that? Uh, I would argue that in the case of Ukraine, we are sending money, we are sending weapons. In the case of, say, Eastern Estonia, we're gonna be sending American troops. And it's better to stop Putin in Ukraine than later on. Now, let me also say, I think the possibility of Putin attacking a NATO country is probably pretty small, but it's not zero. And had you asked me or my colleagues, say, three years ago, do you think that in February 2022 that Russia will launch a huge all-out invasion of Ukraine? Most of us would have said no, no chance at all. A third reason why I think uh, we should care is because 30 years ago, we told Ukraine we would care. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, Ukraine had on its territory the world's third largest nuclear arsenal. And that included about 2,000 strategic nuclear warheads that were designed, built, deployed to incinerate American cities and other targets here in the United States. And Ukraine chose to give those weapons up. Uh, a big part of that was this. Uh, this is uh, in Budapest in 1998, I'm sorry, uh, 1994. And I was actually in, fairly involved in this, but uh, this is Russian President Yeltsin, uh, US President Clinton, uh, President Kuchma of Ukraine, and then British Prime Minister uh, John Major signing the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances. And in that document, Russia, Britain, the United States committed to respect Ukraine's sovereignty, its territorial integrity, its independence, and they committed not to use force or threatened to use force against Ukraine. Now, when we were negotiating this, Ukrainians asked US officials, including people like me, what will you Americans do if the Russians violate those commitments? And we told them back in 1993 and 1994, the United States will take an interest, we will do things. Now, we did qualify it in one way. This is the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances for Ukraine, not security guarantees. And because we told the Ukrainians explicitly, we are telling you now, we are not committing to send American troops. But I look back at what we've done over the last 18 months, and I think we have fulfilled that spirit and, and, and the commitment we made back in 1994. And I think it was important because what Ukraine did in getting rid of those 2,000 nuclear weapons 
was a very high priority for US policy back in the 1990s. So let me talk a little bit about the roots of this war um, and start with, go back to probably about 2013. And the first point I would make is in 2013, Russia had in Ukraine a neutral country. Uh, Ukraine's parliament, the RADA, in 2010 had adopted a law that said Ukraine shall have non-bloc status. Ukraine will not belong to NATO. Ukraine will not belong to uh, a Russian organized military pact. Uh, and then Viktor Yanukovych was the president of Ukraine. He was very clear he did not want to bring Ukraine into NATO. But what he wanted to do was bring Ukraine closer to the European Union. And in the summer of 2013, uh, Ukraine had negotiated with the European Union an association agreement, which meant a free trade arrangement, a customs union, and a number of changes to Ukrainian law and regulations that would bring them really into conformance with EU standards and norms. And for years, the Russians had said, we don't care what kind of relationship Ukraine has with the European Union. In the summer of 2013, the Russians decided that they did care and they cared a lot. And they began putting pressure on Yanukovych. They threatened basically to raise the price of energy that Russia sold to Ukraine. They threatened to boycott imports from Ukraine. And they also dangled some fairly obvious monetary bribes uh, to uh, Yanukovych. And so in November of 2013, literally 10 days before Yanukovych is supposed to go and meet EU leaders and sign the association agreement, the Ukrainian government announces we're postponing that. That night, uh, the Maidan revolution begins with several thousand Ukrainians on the street protesting the fact that the idea of the EU association agreement is moving away. And what happened over the next two or three months was that protests, which started out two or 3,000, evolved into a much larger protest, not just about the derailing of Ukraine's effort to get to the European Union, but also against Yanukovych, his growing authoritarianism, and his really epic corruption. So that by January, February, you got hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Kyiv. This is the Maidan Square uh, in downtown Kyiv. Uh, at one point in one of the demonstrations, they said 600,000 people were on the streets in a city of about 3 million. Uh, the demonstrations went on at the end of February, uh, Ukrainian security forces at presumably Yanukovych's command uh, attacked the demonstrators, about 100 were killed, and then Yanukovych just disappears. Um, the next day, Ukraine's Rada, the parliament, appoints an acting president, an acting prime minister, and they say our number one goal is to bring Ukraine, in foreign policy terms, is to bring Ukraine closer to the European Union we will sign the association agreement as soon as we can. And I think that caused a panic in Moscow. So you had literally within a couple of days, Russian military forces, uh, interestingly, all of their uniforms had all of the insignia removed. And initially the Russians claimed, well, those aren't Russian troops, they're local security guys. But they seized Crimea, that yellow part there in the Black Sea. They, they seized it and about three weeks later, uh, Russia illegally annexed Crimea. And then about a month or two later in Donbass in eastern Ukraine, uh, that uh, red and pinkish area off there, uh, you begin to see fighting. And at first, people were saying, well, this is a separatist group. But I think evidence fairly quickly emerged that this was instigated, supported, armed by the Russians. And so by the end of 2014, let's see, in, in that area there, the bright area area was occupied by Russian and Russian proxy forces. And then that's Donbass, it's the Donetsk and Luhansk uh, provinces of Ukraine. Um, that war had real, uh, had real consequences. From uh, 2014 until the end of 2021, about 14,000 people were killed in Donbass in Eastern Ukraine. It was not a frozen conflict, it was very much alive. Uh, and moreover, about one and a half million people left the occupied part of Donbass and were then internally displaced elsewhere in Ukraine. Now, at the beginning of 2021, most people sort of thought the steady state for Ukraine was going to be Russia maintaining its occupation of Crimea and then keeping the conflict in Donbass and eastern Ukraine simmering. And when they wanted to distract or disorient or destabilize the government of Kyiv, they could ratchet up the pressure there. Uh, that changed in May of 2021 when the Russians did a large military exercise um, up here. They brought in a lot of troops and equipment. And at the end of the exercises, 
Um, the troops left, but they left the tanks and all a lot of equipment there. And then we begin to see in October, November of 2021, more troops flowing in, uh, more equipment. And that then positioned uh, the Russians for the military assault that began in February of 2022. Now, when the war began, uh, Vladimir Putin just, uh, yeah, gave a couple speeches, one on February 21, three days before the invasion, and then on February 24. And he rolled out lots of reasons, uh, none of which really make sense. He charged Ukraine with genocide. Nobody agrees with that. He charged Ukraine, we have to need not supply Ukraine, which is an interesting thing to say about a country whose president is Jewish and previous uh, prime minister had been Jewish. And then he accuses Ukraine of trying to reacquire nuclear weapons. Absolutely no evidence for that. Uh, I actually think that there were three reasons why uh, the Kremlin decided to go to war and decide to launch that invasion. One was geopolitical. Is the Kremlin clearly wants a sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space, and Ukraine is a big piece of that. And at the beginning of 2022, the Kremlin was concerned that Ukraine was moving away from Russia, out of that sphere of influence towards the West. Now, the irony here is nothing has done more than Russian policy of the past 10 years to push Ukraine away and towards the West. The second reason is not about geopolitics, it's about domestic politics inside Russia. And that is for the Kremlin, a Western-oriented, stable, democratic Ukraine with a growing market economy, it's a nightmare. Because that kind of Ukraine is going to cause Russians to ask why they can't have the same political voice, the same democratic rights that Ukrainians have. And you have to remember that job number one for the Kremlin is regime preservation. But the third, and I think the most important reason is Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin fundamentally does not accept the right of Ukraine to exist as a sovereign and independent state. He has a very distorted view of Ukraine and the history. And if you actually look at Russia and Ukraine, these countries, uh, they have history, culture, language, religion that are intertwined for hundreds of years. This is a map of Europe uh, at the end of the 10th century. That gray area there, that's Kievan Rus, probably the most powerful empire in Europe at the time. Both Russia and Ukraine claim Kievan Rus as their founding state. And in fact, in Russia, they say, Kiev is the mother of all Russian cities. And so you have this intertwining of language, culture, history, religion. And from 1664 until 1991, with the exception of a couple of chaotic years in World War I, Ukraine, or what is most of modern day Ukraine, was part of the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union. However, Ukrainians were one of the nationality groups that in 1990 and 1991 were leading the push for independence that brought the Soviet Union down. At the end of 1991, uh, Ukrainians held a referendum. 92% of the population of Ukraine voted for independence from the Soviet Union. And even in Crimea, Crimea was the only part of Ukraine where ethnic Russians were a majority of the population. The vote on Crimea was 54% for independence. Uh, so you had this push really to establish Ukraine as an independent state. Uh, and for Russia, losing an empire is hard. It was hard for Britain, it was hard for France, but losing Ukraine, I think, was particularly hard. And Vladimir Putin has not reconciled to that. And I look at the way he talks sometimes uh, a year and a half ago, he compared himself at one point to Peter the Great for acquiring lands. And I think part of this is Putin thinking about a legacy in which he wants to reacquire part of the empire that was lost when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Now, let me make a point. This is a war of choice. Ukraine posed no military threat to Russia. So just because, uh, and this was at the beginning of 2022, but it typically from 2005 until 2022, the Russian government spent 10 to 15 times per mu as much per year as Ukraine did on defense. And, and so when this war began, uh, Russia had a majorly moder modernized military. Ukraine largely began the war with legacy equipment left from the Soviet Union uh, 30 years ago. Much larger military on the Russian side, and actually this number here on the Ukrainian side uh, 455,000 includes some territorial defense forces, some reserves. The actual number of Russian or Ukrainian active duty forces was about 250,000, about a quarter of the size of the Russian force. And then, of course, Russia has 4,500 nuclear weapons, 
Uh, Ukraine has zero. They gave them up 30 years ago. Well, we're now in month 19 of this, this war. And uh, it's pretty clear, as I said it earlier, it's not going as the Russians thought. But I look back and I see several phases. Phase one was the early assault. And, and what you could tell is by the Russians who, who attacked Ukraine, um, well, out of um, Belarus, uh, Russia proper, occupied Donbass, and out of occupied Crimea. And it suggested the Russian military had two objectives. One was to take Kyiv very quickly, and the other was to occupy perhaps the eastern two thirds of the country. Now, the, Ukraine, the Russians achieved some success uh, down along here, uh, the northern coast of the Sea of Azov, but they utterly failed in their effort to take Kyiv. And five weeks into the end of the war, by the end of March of 2022, the Russian military basically says, we are withdrawing from northern Ukraine and we're going to ship our goals. Uh, they were not able to get into Kyiv. Uh, phase two then uh, was the Russians saying, well, we're going to focus on taking uh, Donbass. Uh, Dodetsk and Luhansk provinces, over three months of heavy grinding fighting in the spring and early summer of last year, they took most of Luhansk, but made very little progress in Donetsk. Um, and then it looked like perhaps the line that the Russian offensive simply ran out of steam, it culminated. And at that point, people were thinking, well, is the war going to stabilize with these lines? But you then went to phase three. And the Ukrainians, uh, for a lot of the summer, were talking about mounting a counteroffensive in Kherson down here. And instead, in, uh, they struck here in Kharkiv. That blue area has all been liberated by uh, the Ukrainian military. Uh, and you saw the Russians then begin to a little bit more concerned, a bit more concerned about defense. September, I think, was an interesting uh, month last year in that for seven months, the Russian government said, this is a special military operation. If, if you call this a war in Russia, you can go to jail for discrediting the Russian military. There are journalists who are serving six years in prison now. And part of this was the Kremlin effort to persuade the Russian public, it's a small operation. The only people fighting and dying are volunteers. It's not going to impact you. Well, in September, it became clear that that wasn't going to work. Uh, first of all, uh, the Kremlin announced that they're going to mobilize 300,000 more troops because of losses in Ukraine. Uh, and then what uh, Putin announced at the end of September, uh, there were going to be referenda in these four provinces of Ukraine, Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. And the question was, do you want to become part of Russia? Uh, the referenda were completely bogus. As soon as they made the announcement, everybody said, we know what the results of the Russians will announce will be, that they all voted overwhelmingly to join Russia. Um, the Russian intent, I believe here, was to basically try to signal Kyiv, this is now part of Russia. We will fight for these areas in a way that we didn't fight before. And the Ukrainians simply ignored that and said, we're going to keep fighting. Uh, what was interesting was, even though the Russians announced that they'd annex these four provinces, the Russian military did not control all of these provinces. Three days after Putin made the announcement, his press spokesman was asked, well, where exactly is the line between what we've annexed? And he couldn't say. But the Ukrainians continued to fight because they see this as part of Ukraine quite understandably and quite correctly. Um, by the end of the year, you then had this map. Those blue areas there were areas that were occupied by the Russian military after February of 2022 and then subsequently liberated by the Ukrainian military. So about 60% of what the Russians took in the spring of last year uh, has now been liberated and is back in Ukrainian hands. Uh, the next phase was uh, phase four. You, you may recall hearing about this town of Bakhmut, which is right there in the center. Uh, the Russians fought and finally in May took Bakhmut. Uh, it really was kind of a, not a very strategic victory. The, the town itself doesn't have much military significance or strategic significance, it probably cost the Russians tens of thousands of troops to take that. And my, my belief is one of the reasons that the Ukrainians held on to it or stayed there was they, they calculated that they could inflict many more casualties on the Russians than they would suffer in doing so. After that, uh, though in May, the assessment of the US intelligence community was it looks like you know the Russian offensive has run out of steam. And of course, then we had during the summer, the focus was when will Ukraine do its counteroffensive? 
And people were looking at sort of four areas. Uh, the areas that are of, I think, most interest now are this part here in Zaporizhia in southern Ukraine, and then around uh, Bakhmut, where the Ukrainians are at, have launched a new counteroffensive. Now, the counteroffensive has not gone as well as people like me had hoped. Uh, it's making progress, it's grinding, uh, but it's, it's a pretty tough struggle. Uh, this shows the defensive line uh, in Zaporizhia. So you first have anti-tank ditches, then you have other barriers designed to stop tanks and armored vehicles, and then you have manned trenches. And all the areas in between are seed with mines. Ukraine is probably today the most heavily mined country in the world. Um, and, and, but the Ukrainians seem to make in some progress. This is that area in Zaporizhia. And in this area, what you can see, that blue area, the, Ukraine, the Russians typically have about three defensive lines with most of the effort in that first line. Well, in this area here, the Ukrainians have breached the first line. They're now beginning to breach the second line. And the, the thinking is that the third line may be even weaker. So the question would be is, can they break through that line and then really begin to rout Russian forces in the south? Um, I, I'm not going to make that kind of prediction. Uh, but I, people who follow say that you know the Ukrainians still probably have about four to six weeks uh, to achieve this. And some of the critical questions are, do they continue to have things like artillery ammunition to sustain the offensive? So this is where I think we are today. Um, the Kremlin clearly expected a quick victory. Uh, and they miscalculated in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, they underestimated Ukraine's will to fight. Um, for Ukrainians, this war is existential. If they lose, their democracy's gone, Ukraine's gone. Um, the NATO Secretary General yesterday made an interesting observation. He says, if Ukraine loses, Ukraine's gone. If Russia loses, you know, you have a chance of restoring peace in that part of the world. I think it's a pretty clear distinction. Uh, so the Ukrainians are fighting in a way that the Russians simply did not expect. Um, the Russians, I think, in the Kremlin, people actually expected that the Russian military would be welcomed as liberators. Uh, the Ukrainians reported that Russian soldiers they captured in the initial assault on Kyiv had three days of food rations. They thought it was going to be over that quickly. Uh, the Ukrainians reported shooting up a Russian convoy, and they said it was interesting. In one of the trucks, what we found were boxes of brand new dress uniforms, and they suspected that those were for the victory parade in Kyiv that never happened. Uh, so I think the Russians really miscalculated about the Ukrainians. The Russians also really overestimated their own military capabilities. It's been astonishing in terms of poor leadership, poor tactics, poor logistics. And you know, we've talked about for years, those who follow Russia, corruption in, is pretty endemic in society. There was no reason to think that the defense sector was immune. And the Russians are finding lots of weapons that they're now trying to use are not performing uh, to their specifications, including things like 60,000 tactical radios that were supposed to be encrypted that simply don't work. Uh, in a couple cases, uh, uh, Russian general officers, out of frustration, uh, whipped out their, their iPhones. Uh, in one case, the calculation was it was Ukrainians 14 minutes from the time they picked up the transmission to the time they had a drone overhead putting the weapon on that officer. Um, so the tools that the Russian army has are not what they thought. Uh, another thing I think Putin miscalculated is he looked at the West and said, the West is divided, the West won't respond. And in fact, actually the West has responded fairly quickly. And I'll talk a little bit about um, US diplomacy on that. So you've had uh, West moving to basically rearm NATO, uh, weapons deliveries. The, the Germans have now provided Leopard tanks. Uh, we're providing M1 tanks. And a number of countries have begun training Ukraine to receive F-16s probably at the end of this year, early next year. That's a surprise to the Kremlin. The Kremlin, I think, also did not expect the sanctions. Uh, the sanctions were imposed very quickly. Uh, one sanction um, Vladimir Putin, I think, would have seen as an asset uh, going into this war was he had $630 billion in foreign currency reserves. Unfortunately, the Russian Central Bank had over half of the reserves parked in Western financial institutions uh, they're all frozen now and not available to Russia. And I very much hope the West at some point moves simply to seize them and use them as reparations for Ukraine. Uh, the sanctions also included a cutoff of high-tech goods, semiconductors, chips, uh, designed hopefully to cut off the things that the Russians actually use in their military 
uh, weapons because they can't produce these in Russia. Now, that the problem we have now is uh, basically we have third countries serving as, uh, as passing through. Uh, and so I think that's one of the challenges the West has to do is how do you cut those supplies going to third countries? So the impact has not been as deep as we thought a year ago with the sanctions, but I think it still has an impact. So this shows uh, Russian gross domestic product growth. It was declining through most of last year. It started growing earlier this year, although a couple factors to keep in mind. One is uh, two years ago, the Russian economy devoted about three to 4% of GDP to the defense part, uh, sector. Uh, it's now up to about seven to 8%. So most of that blue growth early this year is not going to civilians, it's increased defense spending. But the other question is, can they sustain this? Uh, Russia's two biggest export earners are export of oil and natural gas. And what you can see in this chart is that those revenues coming to Russia are decreasing over the last 18 months. And if we can continue that, at some point, the Russians may have a hard time finding the money to sustain the, ex to sustain the effort. So look at these miscalculations. Why the miscalculations? I'll give you a couple of reasons. One is, fundamentally, I don't think the Kremlin understands Ukraine. The last time Putin was in Kyiv was 10 years ago, and he gave a speech where he said, we Russians and Ukrainians are one people. That's an utterly tone-deaf speech to give in Kyiv, because ethnic Ukrainians, or a large number of them, hear that as, you've denied my culture, my language, my history. Um, a second a problem I think that the Russians have is Vladimir Putin operates in a very closed inner circle. And the people in the inner circle are largely like Putin. They come from the security service. They're from the KGB or its successor agencies. They share a worldview, a similar outlook. There's not a very broad range of views in that circle. And it's not clear you know, how much information gets there, where it comes from, other than from the security services. And it's not clear that there's anybody in that circle who's prepared to take, oh, Putin, boss, you're making a mistake. Uh, so that echo chamber is probably a uh, reason for some miscalculations. Uh, and it's, it became worse over the last two and a half years due to COVID. Uh, what we saw was uh, the circle around Putin became even tighter. So that picture on the upper right, uh, that's Vladimir Putin on February 21 of last year, meeting with his advisors, none of whom was within 40 feet of him. The picture on the bottom left is six days later, he's meeting with the defense minister and the chief of the Russian general staff. This is about three days into the war, 35 feet away. So you've got this inner circle, which has become even more compressed over the last three years. And my guess is that echo chamber has simply produced more echoes. But I think finally, the last reason is Putin's change. This is somebody I would have said 15 years ago, does try to make rational cost benefit calculations. But over the last 15 years, he seems to become more emotional. And when it becomes to Ukraine, he becomes angrier. And that emotion, that anger, are clouding his ability to make the judgments he should be making. Plus, he's been in office now for 23 years. There's a certain arrogance that comes with that. He's, he's done it all. He knows it all. And he's probably not inclined to take advice that goes against his uh, gut instincts. So I think these are some of the problems that have produced the blunders that Russia has made and are continuing to make in this war. So let me look, look forward now, and I'll start by saying, ideally, the Kremlin would conclude this war, the costs outweigh any gains, and they would end it. Uh, there's no sign that's gonna happen. Um, so let me look and say, what might things look like? Or I, I'm posing some questions, what things might look like in summer 2024, so 10, 12 months down the road. And the first question would be, uh, is can the Russians win? And I would say at this point, certainly not in the sense of their original goal, which was to take two thirds of Ukraine. I don't know any military expert who thinks that the Russians conceivably could achieve that. Uh, the other question then, if they can't do that, could they go back to scale back objectives, which would be just occupy those light gray areas there and occupy all of the four provinces that they supposedly annexed a year ago. And most military experts, I think, doubt the Russian military is capable of doing this. So. I guess the one prediction I would make with some confidence is, however the war ends, uh, the map of Europe has a sovereign and independent Ukrainian state on it. And it will be much larger than the rump state that the Kremlin intended to leave behind in February of 2022. So the second question would be, if the Russians can't win, can the Ukrainians win? 
and or at least if not pushing the Ukrainian Russians completely out, at least push the Russians back to the line on February 23 of last year. Um, I think the Ukrainians can liberate more land. Here's what I think the Ukrainians would like to do. They would actually like uh, that Zaporizhia offensive where I showed you earlier to be able to break through and then drive to the Sea of Azov. And that would have some really important implications. It would sever the road and rail communications that run from Rostov on Don here down to northern Crimea. That would severely complicate the ability of the uh, Russians to supply forces, particularly if the Ukrainians could then target uh, the Kerch Strait Bridge down here. Um, I think the Ukrainians can liberate more land. I'm not sure that they can actually reach the Sea of Azov. We'll get, I think, a good sense of that in the next four to six weeks. The third question then would be is, well, you know, what happens if neither side can win. Uh, and my guess is at this point, uh, a year from now, you're still going to see some fairly heavy fighting uh, with neither side having made a breakthrough of a kind that would cause the other side to yield. Uh, and in part of this is because both sides are, are, are pretty dug in. In the case of Russia, I mean, Vladimir Putin is all in. I think Putin understands that his political prospects are probably pretty closely tied to the outcome of this war. Uh, and if he loses, uh, there's a chance he could survive politically, but my guess is he doesn't see that that way. Um, he also looks at Russia. He thinks, I, my, Russia, we have a larger economy. We have more money. We have a larger military. We ought to be able to prevail. So I think Putin is submitted. There's one other factor here. I think Putin will play it out, at least see what happens in 2024 in the United States. Uh, he's been pretty open about who he wants to see win our presidential election in November of next year. And I think he looks at the Republican Party where three of the four leading candidates now either oppose U.S. assistance to Ukraine or raise se severe questions about it. And he's betting that if, you know, in that kind of outcome, that there might be a cutoff of American assistance to Ukraine. Uh, so I think he's committed on the Ukrainian side, and I'll talk about this in a bit more detail, but I think the Ukrainians are fully committed. Polls now show 90% of the Ukrainian population say they want to fight until the Russians are out of everything. And that's not just Donbass, but also out of Crimea. Um, so it raises the questions, a negotiation. Uh, I think at some point there will be a negotiation between Kiev and Moscow, uh, but it's not going to happen for some time to come. Uh, first of all, in Moscow, there's no sign that the Russians are serious about negotiations. They simply repeat maximalist demands They've actually grown. It was interesting. I, I talked about how uh, Putin said we've now annexed, and this was at the end of September of last year, Putin claimed to be annexing those four parts of Ukraine. Well, he was doing that even though the Russian military for the previous two months had been losing on the battlefield. So they're losing on the battlefield, but he's escalating the claims. On the Ukrainian side, um, they're also pretty dug in. Uh, I, I think if you go back to March of last year, uh, the Ukrainians were looking to end the war. They were prepared to accept neutrality. There were some indications that I interpreted that they were even prepared to make some concessions with regards to territory. The Ukrainian attitude changed over the course of March of 2022. And a big part of it was as they pushed the Russians back from northern, the northern part of Kyiv, they liberated towns such as Bucha, Irpin, Bordyanka. And they saw mass graves, Bucha alone, uh, 500 people killed, torture chambers. Uh, they, residents talked about organized rape, uh, forcible deportation of children back to uh, Russia. Uh, and then they saw uh, the case of Mariupol. Uh, Mariupol's on the Sea of Azov. It's fairly close to the Russian border. Half the population of Mariupol was ethnic Russian. And probably over 90% of the population of Mariupol spoke Russian as their first language. And the Russian army besieged the city for three months. Uh, the estimate was 95% of the buildings were either destroyed or damaged in that. And these things have really hardened the will of Ukrainians, and they've hardened the wills of President Zelensky. You know, he is not prepared now, I think, to make some of the concessions he would have made early on to try to stop the war. And even if he were prepared, I don't think he could sell it to the Ukrainian public. Uh, the Ukrainian public attitude has really hardened against Russia. So I, I look at this war and I, I say, it seems to me that there's a question here. What happens first? Does 
the impact of the sanctions, but more importantly, does the impact of the steady flow of casualties coming back to Russia erode the will of the Russian public and even the Russian elite to continue the war before running out of weapons and ammunition erodes Ukraine's ability? The Ukrainian will is going to be there. And the US and the West can help keep the Ukrainians prepared with the ability. We have a big say in this. So, so let me talk a little bit about the uh, President Biden, the Biden administration's policy. Um, I was asked at a talk at Stanford just about 11 months ago to give them a grade. I gave them a B plus. It's now down to about a B. And I'll explain why. I mean, first of all, though, let me say they did a marvelous job at the end of 2021 in January, February of 2022 in the diplomacy. So you had negotiation or talks going on in NATO. You had the G7 talking. <clears throat> and probably at those days, you, people didn't see it, but there were probably dozens of meetings, phone calls, Zooms with allies in Europe and Asia talking about what the Russians might do, uh, and including a lot of intelligence sharing by the United States. And as a result of those very intense consultations, literally within days after the Russian military crossed the border uh, in February of 2022, you had the West moving to uh, basically increase NATO defense preparedness, the flow of weapons to Ukraine began to increase, uh, and, and adoption of sanctions. And the administration has said, going back really to the very beginning, they have two goals in this war. One is they want to help Ukraine win and throw the Russians out. The other goal is to avoid a direct military clash between NATO and Russia. And those are the right two goals. Uh, where I give the administration a B and where I fault them is when they balance those two goals, I think they've been too cautious. Uh, that they, uh, they are properly, they are taking account of not overly provoking the Russians. Uh, but I, I think they've been, they've made the right decisions ultimately, but it's taken them longer than was necessary. Uh, so we decided to provide M1 tanks, but that was after about five or six months of debate. Uh, likewise, on the F-16s, Things have happened, and I agree that doing it, we we within this case, we've kind of boiled the Russian frog frog slowly. Had the United States back in March of last year, a, a month of war, said we're sending F-16s and M1s, there could have been a very nasty Russian reaction. Uh, the Russians, to my mind, have turned out to be very poor at drawing red lines. Uh, doesn't mean the Russians don't have red lines, but they haven't done a good job of drawing them. Uh, and I I think you know we have been slower than we could have been uh, to give the Ukrainians more capability to defend themselves. Now, there's also, a, there was a NATO summit in July in Vilnius, and, and that was one where I think you saw a bit of the American caution. Uh, there was some hope that you, NATO could define some kind of a path for Ukraine to deepen its relationship with the alliance. Uh, and, and the outcome was fairly vanilla. Um, and I think that was caution uh, on the part of the American administration, but also on a part of a number of allies. Uh, and what they did, agreed instead was the G7, the group of seven leaders, met on the, on the sidelines of that summit. And they agreed that when the war is over, they will provide arms and other support to Ukraine with the idea of Ukraine building a military force that is sufficiently strong that the Russians would not consider a new attack. And I think that's a good way station, uh, but I've come to a conclusion that ultimately the best security guarantee for Ukraine is going to be NATO membership. Uh, for a number of years, I think NATO allies deferred to Russian concern, where the Russians said, we don't want Ukraine in NATO. Russia still seized Crimea. Russia still provoked a conflict in Donbass. And then Russia launched this massive invasion. And it seems to me that even if we arm Ukraine, as long as Ukraine is alone, uh, Ukraine is going to be a tempting target uh, for Russian aggression. And, and ultimately, I think what stops that is NATO membership. The conundrum, though, is, is how do you actually make that happen? And, and, and we need to think about that uh, with a view towards next summer, next July, where there will be a NATO summit this time in Washington, DC. And can at that summit, NATO uh, define a more definitive path for Ukraine? So. As I said, I, I'm not prepared to predict how this war is going to turn out in the next couple of years, but I think you can look at this and say there are some number of implications that you can see, starting with Ukraine. Of course, the war has been a tragedy for Ukraine, tens of thousands killed, probably four to $500 billion conservatively estimated in terms of damage. 
Um, but you've also seen some really interesting changes within the current Ukraine. So when I went to Kiev in 1998, uh, people talked about the Northwest divide. And they basically said that that orange part in Western Ukraine, a higher proportion of the population is ethnic Ukrainian, and people are more likely to use Ukrainian as their first language. In the blue part, Eastern and Southern Ukraine, um, you tended to have people more likely to use Russian as their first language, uh, and higher proportions of ethnic Russians, although not a majority. As I said earlier, Crimea at the bottom, that was the only part of Ukraine where Russians were a majority, ethnic Russians. In Donbass, uh, ethnic Russians were probably about 35% of the population. Ethnic Ukrainians were the majority there, although a lot of ethnic Ukrainians in the 90s were still using Russian as their first language. Well, what you're seeing now is some really interesting changes linguistically. Now, once Ukraine regained independence, of course, when it was part of the Soviet Union, Russia was the first, Russian was the official language. Ukraine is an independent state. You begin to see the number of people using ethnic Russian as their first language decline, and the number of using ethnic uh, using Ukrainian increase. That's accelerated over the last two years. I mean, there's lots of anecdotal evidence of people basically saying, I've had it with Russia. My personal revolt against Russia is to learn Ukrainian and not use Russian again. Uh, but you're also seeing really interesting polling on how Ukrainians self-identify. And I'll just give you the results of two polls. One was conducted in February of 2022, but before the invasion. And the question posed to Ukrainians was, do you consider yourself, your choices were a citizen of Ukraine, a citizen of some region or city of Ukraine, um, a citizen of some particular ethnic group, uh, a European, uh, a former Soviet, what? At that point, um, let's see, 64% of the population said, I consider myself first and foremost a citizen of Ukraine. Three months later, or I guess five months later, in July of 2022, they conducted the poll again. At that point, uh, almost 85% of the population said, I'm a citizen of Ukraine. There was a survey in 2021, so this is well before the major Russian invasion, and they asked people, both ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians in Ukraine, do you agree with Vladimir Putin that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people, they're one people? And in 2021, 41% said yes. They asked the same question about three months into the war, 8% said yes. Uh, and you're seeing now really kind of a revolt in Ukraine against Russia. So uh, this is uh, the, well, it was built in the early 1980s as the arch of friendship between the Russian and Ukrainian peoples. Uh, last year, uh, you'll, you'll see right up at the top there, a crack. The Ukrainians painted a crack in it, took down the statue of the Russian Ukrainian under it, and renamed it the Arch of Freedom. But you're also seeing a revolt against Russian culture. So Odessa uh, was founded uh, at the time of Catherine the Great. Big statue of Catherine the Great in the main city square. The city voted to remove that statue. And Pushkin is a very popular uh, Russian writer in Ukraine. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of statues of Pushkin around Ukraine. Uh, they're all being taken down. Uh, you see stories now of uh, Ukrainians turning in books by Russian authors or in Russian, turning them in to be pulped and recycled. One non-governmental organization in Kyiv collected 60 tons of books to be converted, and then hopefully they said, hopefully reprinted as books about Ukraine and in Ukrainian. And the interesting thing to me is this is not coming at central direction from Kyiv. This is local authorities, and in some cases, just non-governmental groups of Ukrainians saying, we've had it with Russia. And I think this is one really big aspect of Russia's or Putin's war against Ukraine, is you now have a Ukrainian population that detests Russia and Russians. Uh, a year ago, I talked to a Ukrainian friend. I said, well, are you mad at Kremlin and Putin? Are you mad at Russians? He said, no, we're mad at Russians. The Russian population is letting Putin do this to us. That is a huge change from when I served in Ukraine at the end of the 1990s. Had you asked me in the 1990s, I would have said about 5% of Ukraine's population is really anti-Russian mainly in the far western part of Ukraine, the more nationalist part of Ukraine. Bulk of Ukrainians I talked to either were favorably disposed to Ukraine or towards Russia. Uh, they had friends, they had relatives living in Russia, or they were ambivalent. 
that's changed and it will take decades to overcome the enmity now in Ukraine towards Russia and Russians. So Putin's war, it's been a tragedy for Ukraine, but I would also argue it's been a disaster for Russia. So you may have seen about uh, three weeks ago, the leak came out that the US government now estimates that the Russian military has suffered 300,000 casualties, including 120,000 soldiers killed in action. Those are huge numbers. I mean, that 120,000 is probably close to eight times what the Soviet Union lost in Afghanistan over 10 years. Uh, they've lost incredibly large numbers of equipment. It will take the Russian defense budget years and years and years to replace what they've lost, including, for example, about 60% of, of their modern main battle tanks. So you see pictures like this. So Russian train heading towards Crimea, uh, it's carrying tanks. Those tanks are T-55s. Those tanks were built 60 to 70 years ago. And they've been sitting out in the wastelands in Siberia. And the Russians are now trying to rehabilitate some of these so they can actually be used uh, because their modern T-72s, T-80s, T-90s uh, have largely been destroyed in Ukraine. So I, I look at this, I think this is a military disaster for Russia. It's also, I think, a interesting political question. You probably saw the news at the end of June when uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, who heads the Wagner Group, launched a military mutiny. I mean, he sees Rostov on Don. This is a city of a million people. He sees it with no trouble. And one of his military columns uh, was within about 120 miles of Moscow when they finally worked out a settlement where he called it off. Um, now, it was interesting. Prigozhin's revolt was not against Putin. It was against the Russian military leadership. There's been bad run between Prigozhin and the Russian military going back years to Syria. Uh, but it displayed a system that was pretty brittle. Uh, and my guess is that even though the, the revolt was directed not against Putin, uh, it was likely Putin's decision that caused uh, uh, probably a bomb to be placed on Prigozhin's plane, which uh, blew up two months to the day uh, after that military mutiny. But I think it's been a political disaster in that you know, Russia looks somewhat like a banana republic now. Uh, it's also, I think, been even though the sanctions have not been as hard hitting as we had hoped, it's also causing problems. You know, Russia will fall behind in high tech composition because of the cutoff of high tech goods, especially if we can close the loopholes. You saw in 2022, a significant outflow of Russian IT workers who worked for American companies in Russia. And they were basically told, we can no longer pay you to work in Russia. They're now in Turkey, Georgia, Armenia, and some are in Western Europe. And I'm not sure how many of those people go back. So this technology gap between Russia and the outside world, I suspect is going to grow. Uh, but there's also, I think, some other implications. I mentioned that oil and gas were the first and second uh, export earners to Russia. Well, this simplified design here, uh, Yamal in Siberia is, is the main Russian gas producing region now. Over the last several decades, the Russians have built a pipeline structure, all those blue lines that go off to the left toward Europe, to export about 80% of that natural gas to Europe. Over the last year and a half, Europe has begun to significantly cut back their use of, of, of Russian natural gas. And the problem that creates for Moscow is they have limited facilities to convert that gas into LNG and then ship it somewhere, um, but they have no pipelines. Well, they have one pipeline here, but there's no pipeline going from Yamal to China. That's about 4,000 miles of pipeline that will take years and tens of billions of dollars to build. And so at some point, uh, you are likely to see the Russians having to begin to shut down national gas production because they can't export it. And Consequently, you're going to see a big fall in uh, Russian uh, revenues from that. Uh, I think a, a fourth area where this has been a disaster is geopolitically. Um, the Russian invasion has been a game changer for Europe. You see NATO rearming, I think three years ago, uh, NATO had set a goal in 2014 that by 2024, each NATO member would be spending 2% or more of gross domestic product on defense. Probably three countries met that standard three years ago. It's between 11 and 14 now, with more expected to meet it by the time of the Washington summit next year. Uh, Poland last year spent close to 4% of its GDP on gross on, on defense. 
And, and so you see a, a situation which should be unwelcome to the Russians, that NATO now seems to be much more focused on Russia as a military threat in a way that NATO was not five or six years ago. Uh, in Germany, uh, about a week after the Russian invasion began last year, uh, the German chancellor gave a speech called the Zeitenwende, which is a major historical turning point. And in that speech, he basically erased five decades of German policy towards Russia. Uh, and he announced things like 100 billion euros, it's $110 billion to help, Ukraine, uh, help Germany rearm announced that Germany was going to dump a policy. Germany had for decades a policy said, we do not export weapons to countries in conflict. They dumped that policy so they could begin exporting weapons to Ukraine. Uh, there were questions in 2021 that Germany is one of five NATO countries that participates in what we call nuclear sharing, where they actually have aircraft that might, in no conflict, deliver American nuclear weapons. People in 2021 would have said, the Germans are going to abandon that. They're going to let their planes simply age out. Well, uh, the German chancellor announced, no, we're going to buy F-35s, which will be nuclear capable aircraft. Uh, now the Germans have been slow in implementing this stuff and they've gotten a lot of criticism from Ukraine and, and partners. And, and some I think it's deserved, but it, it's clear that this, if you think of German foreign policy as a super tanker, it's beginning to turn and it's turning away from Russia. And, and that's a loss for, uh, for uh, Russia. Um, and then finally, if you look at the, the uh, Baltic Sea, in May of last year, Finland and Sweden, two countries that had been neutral for decades, formally asked to join NATO. Finland is now in. My guess is that there's a good chance by the end of this year that Sweden will be in. The Baltic Sea then becomes a NATO lake. So if you look at this, NATO now having two more countries involved, the Baltic states, which had relatively low NATO military presences two years ago, maybe 1,000 to 1,500 troops in each of the Baltic states, they're now talking about putting brigades of four to 5,000 troops in each of those areas. You know, this has been a geopolitical disaster for Russia. And just the last comment will be uh, on what this means for U.S.-Russia relations. And I personally, I'm disappointed in this. I probably spent half of my 27 years at the State Department working on trying to improve relations between Washington and Moscow. Uh, but it's pretty clear that this relationship with Russia is going to be very difficult, I think, for some time to come. And I would say that there are probably two things that have to happen before you can even begin to move back towards something that begins to look a little bit like normalcy. And one would be Vladimir Putin leaves the Kremlin. Now, let me be clear, I am not advocating that the United States government adopt a policy of regime change towards Russia. We're not smart enough about the Kremlin to figure that out. But I'm just making an analytical statement. How does an American president or a British prime minister or a German chancellor sit down and negotiate with Vladimir Putin now, given what he's done, the blood on his hands, and now he's an indicted war criminal? So I just don't, I think it's going to be very, very hard. So I think Putin has to leave, and whoever comes in behind him, there have to be some significant changes in Russian policy uh, that show this is a different Russia. And the biggest change that would work would be if the Russian government accepted this map I'm about to show you, which was posted by the Canadian mission at NATO back in 2014. Uh, if Russia accepts that, I, I think it'll be easier for the world to live with Russia. Uh, but unfortunately, we're probably in a situation now where that may be some time to come. So let me end my comments at that point. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Steve. We will be handing out the microphone, so please wait for us. And we'll start right over in the back this time okay. instead of the front. George? Uh, there are two countries that are sort of tangential to this. Could you speak for a moment about Belarus and Turkey? Two very interesting countries. Okay, Belarus, I think, is the one Russian partner in this, um, and is probably the only post-Soviet state that is comfortable about what Russia is doing against Ukraine. And that is because uh, the leader of, uh, of Belarus, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, uh, basically he ran for re-election three years ago. This is somebody who was elected back in 1994. And Every election since then in Belarus has failed to meet the standards of free and fair. Uh, in the 2020 presidential election, 
uh, the estimate was that Lukashenko lost. Uh, he proclaimed victory, uh, arrested political opponents, and got very strong support from Putin. So Lukashenko has been supportive of Putin, in part because I think Lukashenko realizes that he needs Putin's support domestically to hold on to power within Belarus. So he did consent to allow uh, Russian forces to deploy to Belarus in early 2021, I'm sorry, early 2022, and part of the attack on Kyiv actually came out of Belarus. Uh, that was a year and a half ago. He hasn't done anything like that since then. And uh, Belarusian military forces have not gotten involved. So I think there's some limits in terms of how much support he's prepared to offer Putin, uh, even though he's probably, uh, in terms of who Putin talks to on the international stage, uh, you know, Putin's pretty isolated. Uh, Putin probably sees Lukashenko more than anybody else. Turkey is very interesting. Uh, Erdogan, who was re-elected in May, um, Erdogan is playing this interesting game where he has relations with both sides. He's probably the Western leader now that has the best relationship with Putin, um, but he's also been you know, supportive of Ukraine. So he's actually been in Moscow visiting Putin and say, told him, you know, I don't recognize your annexation of Crimea. Uh, Turkey early on was providing some very effective drone weapons that the Ukrainians were able to use uh, before the flow of uh, other Western weapons began to come in. So Erdogan's playing kind of this interesting game. I, I think at the end of the day, Erdogan understands that he can't sever the Western connection. Uh, probably the West would like to see him less engaged with Russia. And again, I worry that Turkey is probably one of the conduits of things like semiconductors to Russia. Uh, but it's one of the things we have to live with now with the Turks kind of pursuing this balancing policy. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, this presentation, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I, I, have, I have some dear friends who are with our embassy in uh, Chisinau in uh -huh. Moldova. And uh, as you know, uh, part of Moldova is also occupied by Russian forces. Uh, do you see any good outcome for that country of Moldova since they are right next to Ukraine? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Moldova is a country that I think has long tried to do the right thing. I mean, I, I, I used to go there uh, once a year when I in my last uh, job at the State Department and used to meet regularly with President Veronin, who was from the Communist Party. Uh, but even he was trying to sort of walk a course where he could slowly move Moldova towards the West. The, the current leadership in Moldova wants to move towards the West. Uh, and they've got a very supportive partner in Romania. Uh, so they're watching though with some anxiety as to what's happening in Ukraine. I think the Moldovan fear is that had the Russian offensive succeeded, and it looked like one of the vectors was designed basically to go along the top of the Black Sea, take Odessa, and then all go to the way of the Moldovan border. I think there was some concern in Moldova that had Russia prevailed in Ukraine, that Moldova might have been next. Uh, so they're fairly clear on their outcome. And they've taken some fairly interesting steps. They've actually significantly reduced the presence of Russian diplomats in Moldova, basically because they look at the Russian embassy and say there are a lot of intelligence officers there. Uh, so they are, I think, trying to move to the West. The, the problem that they have is they are probably, you know, in the bottom three countries uh, of Europe in terms of just being uh, the poverty levels. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if the Ukrainians prevail and Moldova moves more forcefully to the West. What does that do to that lower, thin strip Transnistria, which broke away uh, back in 1992 and still has a Russian military presence there, although it's basically there to, to keep Transnistria out of Moldovan hands? This war could have an impact on whether the Russians could sustain that. Uh, thank you. Great, uh, great wrap up of what's going on there. My family is from the Ukraine, and I have very close ties. I visited there in 1990 when the Russians were getting ready to leave. And uh, my question is really about what's going on between Slovakia, Poland, and Hungary, and why they're refusing to buy yeah. Ukrainian 
um, wheat and farm products. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, this, I mean, first of all, let me say, I think Poland has been one of the most supportive NATO countries. If you had to list which countries have been most supportive of Ukraine, Poland would easily be in the top three. Slovakia has also been very supportive of Ukraine. Slovakia took their entire air force of MiGs and basically transferred it to Ukraine. Uh, Hungary is, is, is the laggard. Uh, but here you have, in each case, domestic politics. There's going to be an election in Poland, I think, in about five weeks, maybe a little bit earlier. And there's concern in Poland, Hungary, and Slovakia that if they simply open up the borders to Ukrainian grain, it's going to basically drive down the prices that their domestic farmers can get. So the EU has been trying to work this problem. It goes back a year, is because the Russians have really reduce the ability of Ukraine to export grain out of Odessa and Black Sea ports by ships. The, the grain deal that was there with Russian agreement expired about three months ago. And, and so there's the alternative moving grain by rail and truck into EU countries. Uh, but the concern in Poland, Hungary, is that that grain will then be sold in their countries and then cut off prices to constituencies that are very important domestically. So the European Union is trying to work this out. Uh, they worked out an arrangement, I think about six or seven months ago, where the countries allowed the grain to come in. We'll see what happens this time. My guess is in the case of Poland, probably nothing happens until after the election. Uh, the question I have <clears throat> is concerning China mm -hmm. and India uh, and what relation they have with the Soviet, with Russia, yeah. and how it plays into the uh, situation. Yeah, uh, I, I, two countries with very different approaches. I think President Xi sees President Putin as a partner in Xi's goal, which is, I think, to undermine American power and influence. Um, I, I think, though, President Xi is probably concerned about Russian performance. My guess is. Putin was actually in China, I think it was about two weeks before the Russians launched the invasion. I suspect Putin told something to Xi about this, uh, but I suspect it was, we're going to do this, it'll be over in one or two weeks, no big deal. And that was 19 months ago. Uh, that was at the same time where Putin and Xi put out a statement where they said, we have a limitless partnership. Well, what we've seen is, in fact, there are some limits to that partnership. So there's, I think, some suspicion that the Chinese are providing the Russians some industrial goods that can be useful in defense sector production. The Chinese thus far have not provided weapons. And, it's, and, and part of the problem for Putin is that, yes, Xi wants to help him, but also Xi understands his biggest trade relationship, or are, are the two biggest relationships are with the European Union, about $600 billion a year, and the United States, $600 billion a year. Those combined are about 10 times his economic relationship with Russia. And I don't think Xi wants to endanger those economic relationships. They're very important for domestic reasons, political reasons within China. So there are some limits in terms of how far China is prepared to go. Uh, and I think there's some things where the Chinese uh, last year, uh, there were concerns about nuclear threats. I think the Chinese privately went to the Russians and said no. Uh, India is kind of, I think, in a different situation. I mean, India has historically had a close relationship with Russia, although the U.S.-India relationship has been developing fairly significantly in the last five or six years, in part because I think India is looking for a relationship with the United States, Australia, and others because of the, their concerns about China. Uh, so India thus far has not been prepared to criticize Russia. Uh, what they have done, as the Chinese have done, is as Europe has refused to buy Russian oil, they basically said, we'll take advantage of that. Uh, we'll buy Russian oil. And they, they dramatically increased their imports of Russian oil. Uh, but one of the things that actually works is, you know, if you're shipping Russian oil from, say, the ba a Baltic seaport to Europe, your transportation costs are a lot lower than if you're shipping that all the way around Europe uh, through the, uh, you know, or either around Africa uh, you know, or through the, uh, the canal. Uh, so at least we're reducing revenues. And, that, and that's been one thing the West has tried to do is one, on one hand, the West does not want 
to cut Russian oil from the global market because that's going to cause prices to go up. You know, we're going to have to pay more for our gasoline here at the gas station. So the focus, I think, properly has been is not on cutting the Russian exports of oil, but cutting the revenues that go back to Russia. So when Russia sells more oil to India and China that used to go to, say, Germany uh, or Britain, less revenues are going back to Russia. And the West has also imposed this thing, which I, I'm still not quite sure whether it's working or not, but it's a price cap. And, and basically, uh, if you look at oil tankers, probably about 80 to 90% of the tankers that move Russian oil are actually flagged in EU countries. And most of the insurance, I mean, if you have a tanker full of oil, that could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars, you want to have insurance. Most of that insurance comes out of British insurers or European insurers. And so what the West has now said is, if you want to move oil in a European or American or other countries have joined this, a, a tanker under their flag, or if you want insurance from a, from a company in one of those countries, you can buy Russian oil at no more than $60 per barrel, which is significantly under the current price. And the idea is we'll let Russian oil come out, but we will reduce the revenues to Russia. Uh, there's some evidence that this is working. The Russians are trying to find some workarounds to get around it. But then if you could do this and then, then maybe ratchet that price down, the thing is Russia, it's, Russia produces oil at a cost of probably $15 to $20 a barrel. So from the Russian point of view, if, if it's costing them $15 to produce that barrel and they can get even $25 for the barrel, you know, they have an incentive to keep exporting the oil. Uh, but if we can ratchet the price down, we can reduce the revenues and that makes their economic situation more difficult. All right, thank you uh, for clarifying the situation as well as you did. I was really impressed with that. Um, and it's a sad, horrible mess yeah. that's causing a lot of Ukrainian suffering and others. Um, and it seems to me that the position of some presidential candidates is very disturbing because we have no choice but to try to help the Ukrainians at this point. But there's a number of folks who argue that the origins of this mess were quite a bit earlier than 2013 or 2007. Um, isn't it the case that James Baker in negotiating the dismantling of the nuclear weapons in Ukraine agreed that the United States would not expand NATO into yeah. the former yeah. Soviet republics. Yeah. Uh, George Kennan, the ambassador to Russia, yeah. has argued that that was a terrible mistake for the United States. Could you comment on that? Yeah, sure. No, I, I mean, uh, actually, what, something I wrote was declassified, and it's a drafted by uh, EURSOV, Soviet SK Piper. And it said in 1989 or 1990, where Baker said, uh, NATO would not enlarge or would not move to the east. And I should have drafted that better because that was in the context of German unification. Uh, so my understanding was that we were telling the Russians at a time when we were moving to work with Russia, Britain, and France to reunify Germany was that NATO would not be moving forces into East Germany because for the next four years, there were still going to be several hundred thousand Russian troops there because it was going to take them time to withdraw back to Russia. Now, I think some other things that come out have been declassified, which suggested we may have sent confusing signals to the Russians. However, in the final arrangement, there was no final agreement that said NATO would never enlarge. And it was interesting. Um, I, I wrote an article about it back in 2014 or 2015. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was asked about this in an interview, and Gorbachev says, we were talking about just enlargement of NATO in, in Germany. He said, the question of Poland, Hungary, Czech, never came up. This is one of the things I, I think will be argued about, uh, but I guess I would take on the broader point. Uh, and because uh, uh, Ken has made this point, uh, a number of others say that uh, the big cause of this war was NATO expansion. And I just disagree with that. One, uh, back in 1997, before NATO issued invitations to Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic to join NATO, two months ahead of that, there was a NATO-Russia summit where they established a NATO-Russia relationship, and NATO said, we're going to say two things in military terms. One is, NATO has no intention, no plan, no reason to place nuclear weapons on the territory of new members of NATO. So the message with Russia was, enlargement is not going to bring NATO nuclear weapons closer to your borders. 
The second statement NATO said was, in the current and foreseeable security environment, there is no requirement for the stationing or the permanent stationing of substantial combat forces on the territory of new NATO members. So up until 2014, there were no NATO forces virtually in the Baltic states in Poland, consistent with that commitment from 1997. They would come in, they would do an exercise for a week or so, then they would leave. The Baltic states in Poland were not happy about that. After Russia seized Crimea and got involved in the fighting in Donbass, NATO said, okay, we're going to deploy multinational battle groups in each of the Baltic states in Poland. And these battle groups were quite small. They were about, I, mean, I visited the one in, in Lithuania a few years back, about 1,500 troops. NATO basically said, these are tripwire forces. They're not going to stop a serious Russian invasion of the Baltic states. But they're a political signal to Moscow that if you were to attack Estonia or Lithuania, you're going to be fighting NATO. And again, though, there was no troops there until 2014. A couple of other points about Vladimir Putin. In 2002, uh, Putin met with NATO leaders, it was I think in May in Rome, and he signed a document with NATO leaders on deepening and giving a new character to the NATO-Russia relationship. And he did that knowing full well that about five months later, NATO leaders were gonna have a second meeting. He wasn't gonna be at that meeting. And they were going to invite additional states beyond Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic to join NATO. And that quite probably that would include the Baltic states. He made no fuss about enlargement in 2002. So I, I think what's happened is he's dredged this up and it's become more of an issue for him now. And he uses that as an excuse. You know, we had to invade Ukraine because NATO was going to be there. Two or three, two years ago, people would have said there really is no serious push within NATO to bring Ukraine into the alliance because most NATO members were not prepared to go to war with Russia over Ukraine. I, I, I think that may be changing now because of this war. Uh, two other pieces of information. In May of uh, last year, when Finland and Sweden announced they were seeking membership, Putin's reaction was no big deal. And there was an article, I believe it was in the New York Times today, or I, I guess I saw it somewhere on the internet, saying that the Norwegians have said that the military force on the Norwegian-Russian border up at the very top of the, uh, well, up along the Barents Sea up there, is now 20% of what it was two years ago. That doesn't suggest that the Russians are all that concerned about NATO. So again, I think the Russians use this as an argument, uh, but I look back at the history and I don't think that the history where you've seen Russian actions and even Russian statements supports the claim that this war was generated by NATO enlargement. I think it's fair to say that Volodymyr Zelensky has done a remarkable job as a leader. Can you comment on some of the things that you think he has done well? Uh, yeah. Now, if you'd asked me about Zelensky two years ago before the war, I would have said uh, mixed opinion uh, because there was a lot of frustration that you know he was not, while well, he was doing some things well, he was not moving as fast to deal with corruption as people would like. And I can remember a conversation, um, let's see, okay. It was in mid-December, I began to become persuaded, of, I'm sorry, mid-December of 2021. So two months for the invasion, I personally became persuaded the Russians are likely to do something. Um, and part of it was talking to a friend, former, you know, a friend and a former colleague in the government who basically said, I can't tell you intelligence, but it's absolutely bone chilling. And what was interesting was when the intelligence was being talked about publicly, they were talking not about capabilities, but they were also talking about intention. That they, they, they had some pretty hard evidence which proved right about what the Russians were going to do. Um, but so in early January, it's uh, some colleagues at Stanford were talking about what will Zelensky do if the Russians invade? And nobody really had a good fix. Uh, and he is proved to be the ideal wartime president from day one when he basically, the US and the British both offered to extract him from Kiev. And he said, I don't need to ride that Kiev, I need ammunition. And I think I kept, uh, I didn't have it in this presentation, but uh, in an earlier presentation, I used two pictures, one of which was that picture with, of Putin that I showed you meeting with his um, defense minister and the chief of general staff. Uh, and they're 35 feet away at this long table. Well, the same day, there's a picture of Zelensky 
and he's out drinking tea with four or five soldiers manning a checkpoint to defend Kiev. And I just think that captures, I mean, I think Zelensky uh, has mobilized his population. Um, part of it is, I mean, remember his background, this guy was an actor. He knows how to talk to audiences. Uh, and, and I think he knows how to aim messages and he's done, I think, a very good job of building uh, international support for Ukraine. Uh, so, you know, I, I had some questions about how he was as a peacetime president. Uh, I think he's been exactly the wartime president that Ukraine has needed. And our last question for today. Yes, I have a general question about uh, corruption in Ukraine. You yeah. mentioned it briefly just before, because there are some uh, U.S. senators and Congress people that are saying we shouldn't be uh, yeah. backing Ukraine. And one of the reasons is that they're corrupt at a level that's different than other countries. Is that uh, what's your experience in, in the past when you were there and now? Yeah, I, I think corru uh, corruption is still a problem in Ukraine. Uh, but they have, I mean, to be fair, they have made progress over 20 years in reducing corruption. And, and one big thing was when Yanukovych fled in 2014, that, that removed a very corrupt actor. Um, and they're doing things now, and I think that they're beginning to show, and Zelensky's shown, that he understands how Ukraine deals with corruption, even while it's fighting a war, is going to have an impact on the West. So the uh, RADA, Ukraine's parliament passed a bill, say, and it restored what had been in effect until about two years ago, was the, this requirement that all members of government and of the parliament, you know, basically publish uh, an income statement that would be publicly available. Well, Zelensky vetoed it because you'd have to wait a year until it's publicly available and said, no, go back. You know, it should be made available to people. So I, I think there's they're trying to do that. Um, one silver lining of this god-awful war is that uh, it is reducing the economic power of the oligarchs. So I, I showed you that picture of Mariupol, the destruction there. Well, the last battle in Mariupol was for the, uh, the Azov steel mill in Mariupol, which was basically after two months of Russian bombardment reduced to scrap metal. Uh, that was the biggest economic asset of... Uh, a guy named Renat Akhmetov, the richest oligarch in Ukraine. Uh, and I talked to some Ukrainians and said, yeah, one aspect here is that because of the economic damage, the oligarchs are going to have less resources to use for corrupt purposes. So that may have a positive impact. Um, but I, I, I guess the last point I make is, I think there have been some charges made by opponents of supporting Ukraine who are saying, well, how can we account for these weapons? And, and it's, I mean, th there are certain limitations. I mean, you know, we're not going to have American military officers traveling all over wartime Ukraine to say, well, how many shells did you use? Things like that. But there's been no evidence that I've seen that has suggested that any American weapons have been diverted. And again, I think from the Ukrainians point of view, I mean, they're fighting a life and death war. Uh, they're not going to allow people to sort of divert these things and sell them on the black market. So corruption is an issue. I, I think it's a question that will be you know, come back into focus after the fighting. Uh, but I don't think it is a reason for the United States not to be uh, uh, supporting Ukraine now. Steve, thank you for an incredible presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to remind you, please, to turn your phones back on. And I also want to give a big...